Welcome back to Squawk Box this morning. Uh, Gilead shares, they are surging, as is the market, on this report uh, by Stat News saying that a clinical trial of the company's drug, Remdesivir, we've talked a lot about it, is seeing what they're saying is rapid recoveries in fever and respiratory symptoms with nearly all patients discharged in less than a week. If safe and effective, it could become the first approved treatment against COVID-19. The reporter who broke the story spoke to CNBC last night. I did interview a, a patient who participated in the study. He, he lives in Chicago. He, he you know, was short of breath. All the classic symptoms of COVID-19 that you have heard about, he had to go to the hospital. And what he told me, and this is just, again, a single patient's experience, but what he told me was is that essentially he started feeling better like a day after getting remdesivir. And he was in the hospital for four days. He got four days worth of treatment with remdesivir, and he was discharged. Joining us right now to talk more about this and, well, everything else, since we talk to him so often, Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He's, of course, the former FDA commissioner, CNBC contributor, serves on the board of Pfizer and Illumina. Good morning to you. Uh, the market is rocketing on this news, as is, of course, Gilead's stock itself. Uh, Gilead did put a statement out uh, saying that this is only anecdotal evidence and that we need to wait uh, for the final uh, reports and the studies to be complete. But uh, weigh in on what we should be taking away from this news. And again, I, I, I just mentioned why this is so important, because we also had conflicting news out of China, where it appeared they had stopped uh, their studies. And so uh, a lot of the investment community and I think the business of the world was trying to understand what's really happening here. Well, right. China stopped the studies because they couldn't fully enroll them because they stopped accruing cases in China because their epidemic had subsided. So we're not going to get a chance to look at that China data. But the Chinese doctors were trying to use remdesivir. So they did have some indication that the drug was promising that they wouldn't have been trying to reach for it um, against all the other drugs that were available to them on an experimental basis. This is one of a growing number of data sets that suggest that remdesivir is an active drug. It's not a slam dunk data set. There were two deaths in 125 patients that were enrolled in this, uh, this portion of the study, this one arm of a, of a larger study. Um, but most of these patients had severe disease, so they were at higher risk of death. And a, number, a lot of the patients did recover, according to the report that uh, Adam Fuerstein was able to get from, uh, from that institution. But it looks like the drug's active. We said that many times on this show. My hunch is that it's going to work earlier in the disease. So if it's introduced early in disease, it can be an effective drug. It's not a slam dunk by any means. I don't think it's a cure for, for the virus. But I think when used early in the disease, it's a good antiviral and a good first-generation antiviral against COVID-19. And as part of a broader therapeutic um, uh, medicine cabinet, if you will, that we might have available by the fall, right. coupling this maybe with one of the therapeutic antibodies that's in development, that could form a pretty robust treatment set against COVID-19. Doctor, let me understand. This is something you have to, you, you have to, you have to take at a hospital. It's, it's something that, that, that's going to actually be injected into you. Um, and when you say get at it early, uh, currently it appears that most of the people who are taking it are already uh, either on oxygen or ventilators. Is this something that people could take even earlier than that? That's right. I think that a drug like this, if, if, it's, if it works, if it's active against the disease, it's probably going to be most effective when used earlier in the course of disease. So the way this might fit in is when patients have COVID-19 and get first admitted to the hospital, if they have risk factors that would predict that they're going to more, be more likely to have a bad outcome, they might be dosed with this right when they get admitted. That's typically where you'd see a drug like this, which blocks viral replication, be most effective. You want to get it in early before you have a lot of virus on board. Sometimes once you have a lot of virus on board, once the virus has been able to replicate in your body and you have a high level um, and it's created a lot of inflammation, simply arresting viral replication at that point and reducing your viral load, as it will, um, doesn't have as strong of a therapeutic effect. So you want to dose these kinds of drugs earlier. That's how we use, for example, Tamiflu, the drug against flu. You want to get that dosed early. You want to take it right when you first have symptoms to have the maximal benefit. I think that's likely to be how they use this drug. There's other studies underway with this drug looking at milder patients, so looking at introducing it earlier in the course of disease. I think that's where we're likely to see the most robust treatment effect. We need to remember if this drug does work, and there are suggestions that it is active against the disease, and we do, have, we do understand its safety profile pretty well because it was put in a lot of patients with Ebola as well. So there's a big safety database with this drug. But if it does work, I don't think this is a cure. I don't think this is going to be the one, one drug answer to this disease. But it can change the contours of the disease and mitigate the worst outcomes for some patients. Yeah, Scott, as you, as you point out, 
um, it might be in combination with a, a with a monoclonal antibody drug, just like with Ebola. And but, but my point about when it was used with with Ebola is, uh, and then the, I think the antibody drug worked better after that, so it was kind of supplanted by that. Uh, but there was definitely efficacy right. for, for versus Ebola, and and we have safety profiles based on it, so that we don't really need to go through as much of that. But you've never really poo pooed remdesivir, and it should, and rightly so, because the mechanism is so understandable. I mean, it should work because it's it's an analog right. of one of the base pairs that, and it disrupts the polymer, the the, the uh, RNA dependent RNA polymer. It should work, and like you say, right. it, it, I don't know why people weren't more positive all along. Uh, about uh, remdesivir? Well, when I, I wrote about five drugs. Two weeks ago, I wrote in the Wall Street Journal about the five drugs I thought had the most um, promise for being available in the fall and, and having a robust enough treatment effect that they can actually change the risk profile for this disease. And the, the five drugs that I called out was remdesivir and in the four therapeutic antibodies that are in development by Amgen, Veer, Biotechnology, Lilly, and Regeneron. And I think one or more of those antibodies can be available by the fall. And you couple that with remdesivir, which might be a weekly active antiviral that's effective particularly early in disease. That's a pretty robust therapeutic armamentarium that can change the contours of the risk profile for this disease. So I think people are always um, thinking that remdesivir could pull through here. Uh, we do have a big safety database from Ebola. Remember, it wasn't effective against Ebola, or if it was effective, it wasn't effective enough to show benefit against the other drugs that it was competing against it for, it, in that uh, right. master protocol in 2014, one of which was a therapeutic antibody by Regeneron, the same strategy Regeneron is now using against coronavirus. How quickly could, it, let's say just you pull out all the stops, uh, does it, does it, you can't do this off label even right now, right? So it needs, how quickly could you actually get this uh, prescribable uh, for people in the hospital? Or do you well, do a lot of tests and just say, well, they're all, they're part of a test? Yeah, so there's a, there's a broader data set available right now that's probably going to be made public within days, maybe, or certainly within a couple of weeks. I think that's going to include upwards of 400 patients. Um, that data set combined with the compassionate use data that was published a week ago and the fact that they've fully enrolled now a very uh, rigorous study being conducted by the National Institutes of Health, I think that's enough uh, data, if it continues to trend positively, to uh, authorize this drug under an emergency use authorization. So you could see the, the drug made available under an EUA by the Food and Drug Administration you know, within a month if that data set continues to show good top-line results, that the drug's having a treatment effect. Because we understand the safety profile fairly well. And now that that NIH study is fully enrolled, the Food and Drug Administration is going to know that they're going to have a definitive answer on this drug one way or another, because that's a very rigorous study. So you might not wait for the results of that study. Knowing that study is fully enrolled and it will read out might give regulators enough confidence to make this drug available under an EUA.